Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrowski with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. We provide sustainability risk for analysis for investors, banks, and NGOs. And today uh, we have an exciting event for you. Um, we will be discussing our new report, which covers how the palm oil industry will be affected by the EU's actions to curb deforestation. An upcoming law expected to be implemented in 2023 will have widespread implications for the palm oil for palm oil supply chain actors and their financiers. We will discuss the potential cost of compliance along with financial risks of non-compliance. And we'll also dive into issues such as traceability, smallholder exclusion, leakage, and the December 20 uh, cutoff date. In addition, we will also be discussing how the EU's law is influencing similar actions in other jurisdictions around the world. In our discussion today, the, I have a, a few housekeeping um, notes. In our discussion today, the audience will be on mute. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A function and we will hopefully get to them during the Q&A after the presentations. Our speakers today will be Sarah Drost of Aid Environment, Gerard Reich of Profundo, and special guest Itel Higane, an independent environmental expert. She has previously worked for NWF, Greenpeace, MC International, Human Rights Watch, and others, and we thank her for joining us today. And now I'll hand it over to Sarah Drost of Aid Environment to start us off. Hi, everyone. So I will first discuss the role of the EU as an importer of palm oil. Next slide, please. So the EU in 2021 is a significant importer of palm oil and palm oil products, 8 million metric tons with a value of 6.3 billion euros, uh, of which the majority is palm oil, 74%. So if we look at the palm oil trade flows uh, diagram on the left, on the bottom you can see uh, five of the palm oil products that are currently uh, under the scope of the EU regulation, deforestation regulation. So if we look at the, the one most on the left, which is palm oil, uh, we can see that the majority to the EU is supplied by Indonesia in dark green and by, in, by Malaysia in light green. So they will be uh, mostly impacted by this uh, upcoming deforestation regulation, but also some, uh, some other palm oil producing uh, countries uh, will be impacted, such as Guatemala, Papua New Guinea, uh, Honduras, and Colombia. We can also see that uh, Indonesia and Malaysia are the major suppliers of, uh, of the three pie chart products in the middle, which is crude palm kernel oil, refined palm kernel oil, and palm oil cake. So palm oil cake actually represents the second uh, largest uh, product imported in the EU, 18%. But at the same time, uh, the total, the value is only 4% of the total imported value compared to palm oil, which represents 83% of the total imported value. On the right side, uh, you can see that also palm nuts and kernels are imported in the EU, largely uh, originating from Cote d'Ivoire in yellow, and also from uh, Thailand and Cameroon. But in terms of volumes and value imported to the EU, this is only uh, yeah, very close to 0%. Next slide, please. So the majority of this uh, palm oil is actually used as, a, especially the crude palm oil as a feedstock for, for biodiesel production and for energy production. So in the figure on the left, you can see that between 2008 and 2018, the, uh, the amount, the demand for palm oil as a feedstock for uh, biodiesel increased considerably. So in 2018, only about one third of the palm oil used in the EU is for food, animal feed and industrial products. Uh, and this used to be completely different. Uh, but this will change since 2021. Actually, the, there is a decline in the EU use for palm oil for biofuel uh, production. And this is largely linked to the, to the EU Renewable Energy Directive. So uh, this red two, 
basically requires a gradual phase out of uh, palm oil based fuels to zero by 2030. And in our report, you can uh, also read about practical challenges uh, in aligning this EU deforestation regulation and the RED2 uh, regulation. So the European Commission expects that the demand for palm oil in 2031 will drop to 4 million metric tons compared to 6.5 million metric tons in 2021. Next slide, please. So I'm going to discuss in the next slide a few uh, key elements of the EU deforestation regulation. Next slide. Um, so first of all, this table, which is quite big, I'm sorry uh, for being on the slide as such, but uh, you can also uh, see this table in our report and read, uh, read it after this webinar. Um, because it's also comparing the EU deforestation regulations to several other upcoming anti-deforestation regulations, for instance, in the US and the UK. But I'm not diving into this right now because uh, my uh, fellow colleague presenter, Itel, will present on that after my uh, presentation. So it's also good to realize that this is based on the original text of the deforestation regulation. So already there have been several uh, amendments uh, made to the, to the draft text uh, already by a rapporteur based on more than 70 companies and civil society organization, organizations. They have made uh, amendments. And also two weeks ago, the European member states have also uh, made a proposal for some changes in the text. Um, so, while it's still in a proposal stage, uh, it is expected that by September there will be uh, several voting rounds on the, on the amendments. And it's actually planned for implementation in 2023. So, this EU regulation aims to curb uh, both legal and illegal deforestation that is linked to EU consumption and production. Uh, and as such, it is also the most far-reaching uh, legislation if you compare it to, uh, to the US and the UK, because it's also covering uh, legal deforestation, which is basically uh, deforestation that would be still allowed under the local producer country laws. So the European Commission has uh, assessed the, the commodities that, uh, that represent the, the largest share of EU-driven deforestation. And that's how it uh, came up to the selection of six commodities, soy, cattle, cocoa, palm, coffee, and wood, and palm oil, of course. Um, so basically two key elements of the regulations are, first of all, that it has a mandatory due diligence uh, requirement. And secondly, it's also based on a risk benchmarking system of producing countries. So basically this implies that if you, if you are benchmarked as a high risk country, it also means that you will have uh, to do additional due diligence. But as I said before, this is based on the original text. I think based on all the uh, amendments, I have seen that this might change because uh, there's a proposal to remove the, the three tire risk system. Next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, now dive into some key discussions that are relevant for the, for the palm oil industry. Of course, there are many more discussions linked to the, to the regulation, but these are particularly relevant for the palm oil industry. Next slide, please. So I think one of the key discussions uh, is about uh, the traceability requirement in the EU regulation. So that basically requires that operators that are those that first place commodities on the EU market and the traders, they, they should geolocate the coordinates of the plot of land where the, where the commodity is produced. Uh, and again, also in one of the proposed amendments, uh, it is suggested to change this to uh, production areas instead of plots of land. But yes, yeah, since we still don't know which amendments are going to be approved or not, uh, I'm basing myself now on the, on the original text. So basically there are a few major concerns with the feasibility of this traceability requirement. First of all, the concern is that it might exclude smallholders from uh, palm oil supply chains. 
So it can happen that EU purchasers will only continue to buy palm oil from large scale plantations and from contracted smallholders that are also called small scheme smallholders or plasma smallholders that are able to comply with the, with the, the strict requirements. So if we see the figure on the, on the right, you see three potential streams of supply to, uh, to a company's mail. So first of all, the, the mail can source from its own plantations or its own concessions. That is also called inti plantations. Then it can also source from so-called plasma or scheme pla smallholders that are uh, contracted by the company. And the third stream is the, the third party suppliers. And these are often uh, independent smallholder producers that do not have any contracts with the mails or the companies. And actually it is uh, considered that traceability to these non-contracted independent smallholders is going to be tricky, especially since many, small, many middlemen are also involved um, that have unregulated and unregistered transactions with these smallholders. And also these middlemen uh, commonly mix the palm oil fruits at the origin to obtain a certain uh, quality mix. So you can see that these factors uh, might be a challenge to, uh, to achieve traceability to the plot of land. And this is even aggravated by the fact that many independent smallholders are, and, and you have to think about smallholders that have only one or two hectares of land. They often face land tenure issue um, they lack the legal entitlements to the land, uh, also often uh, more than one claim on a certain property exists. Uh, and also it can be that there are crop or land sharing agreements. So for instance, in Honduras, many palm oil smallholders, they manage land under a communal title. A second concern is about about the traceability requirement is that it may require costly and segregated supply chains. But I think it's very important to note that in the current draft text of the, of the regulation, it doesn't mention, nor is it legally required to have segregated supply chains. So there's a lot of discussion about this, but it is not legally requirement, legally required under the, under the EU deforestation regulation. But in practice, it might be still needed. Um, and it may be expensive then if, if it would based, especially on a small scale market segregation strategy, it would be expensive, but perhaps less expensive if it would cover the whole operations of a company. But I'm leaving the discussion about these costs. I'm leaving that to, uh, to Gerard Reich from Profundo, who will later in this webinar dive exactly in this uh, type of questions on, on the costs of compliance. And then finally, there's a concern that the cost might be put on smallholders, which is also a, a real concern, I believe, because it's also happening in the, in the contract between companies and plasma or scheme smallholders that sometimes the, the burden of costs are put on smallholders. But there's also a completely different sound. Actually, there are several smallholder representatives from the palm oil, uh, palm oil smallholder representatives that have actually that are actually very much in favor of this uh, strict traceability requirement. They say that traceability is feasible. They say it's not expensive and it would decrease smallholders' dependence on middlemen, empowering smallholders and shorten their supply chains. Basically, they say that it's, the, it's the, the traders and the operators that actually use the smallholders as an excuse to exclude them from the global supply chains to minimize the cost of compliance. So I think this gives also a lot of uh, food for, uh, for discussion later in the, in the webinar. Next slide, please. So another discussion is, is about uh, leakage of unsustainable uh, palm oil. So there is a concern that due to the regulation um, and the strict import requirements, there may be a leakage of unsustainable palm oil to Indonesia's domestic biofuel market or to countries with less strict, less strict environmental regulations. So Indonesia's domestic biofuel market uh, doesn't have currently any sustainability or traceability requirements. 
So indeed, we have seen with chain reaction research evidence that uh, unsustainable palm oil is indeed leaking in this market and that there are several palm oil companies that continue to deforest that are currently now turning to the domestic biofuel market. Um, also, previous chain reaction research uh, reports on, on leakage markets have shown that South, South Korea, India, Japan and China may provide a, a leakage market for unsustainable palm oil. And finally, uh, currently, not all palm-linked products are uh, at the scope of the EU regulation, such as PFAT, palm fatty acid distillate. Um, and this could also create a leakage in the European Union for not being included, because currently in 2021, more than 1 million metric ton of PFAT was uh, imported in the EU, only from Indonesia. But I also have to say that in two weeks ago, the European Council came with a, a new draft text and they also now propose to include PFAT in the list of products. Another discussion is about the 2020 cutoff date of the regulation uh, that could potentially undermine uh, earlier commitments made by the industry. So in the palm oil sector, it's very common uh, to rely on, on voluntary NDPE cutoff date of December 2015. So NDPE stands for no deforestation, no peat and no exploitation. So actually, actually there is a fear that all the deforestation that occurred between 2015 and 2020 uh, might be whitewashed under this new regulation. Um, and also two weeks ago, the EU Council proposed a new cutoff date even of December 2021. Uh, yeah, so that's not helpful in that regard either. Next slide, please. Some other discussions about the scope of vegetation. So the current uh, EU regulation doesn't is only focusing on forests, and it doesn't include, for instance, Indonesian peatlands. Uh, while peatland destruction is very much uh, linked to oil palm expansion. Uh, the current human rights approach in the draft regulation text is only based on the laws of the producer country. It doesn't include uh, FPIC either, free and prior informed consent, um, but also based on the many amendments that there have been, I think it's very likely that this uh, will change to include human rights approach based on also international uh, laws and conventions. Finally, uh, there's a question whether operators and traders might be compliant with the EU regulation through certification, such as RSPO or FSC. Uh, but the short answer is no. Uh, certification cannot be used uh, as a compliance, only as a source of complementary information. And this is based on the fact that uh, the Commission has made uh, research on the on certification systems and, and revealed also quite some uh, shortages of these uh, certification systems. Next slide, please. So this is actually my last slide. Um, so the regulation may risk uh, supply decline in the EU. So the regulation doesn't occur in isolation. Uh, it's also uh, happening in a global commodity crisis linked to either a conflict or, or climate change, think of Russia, Ukraine, or the droughts in, in Canada, for instance. So there is a risk that this may amplify uh, supply chain shortages. And it's actually the food and feed industry that is saying that these strict EU requirements uh, will therefore uh, follow in increased palm oil prices, um, which, um, um, no. Okay, but in, in response, civil society organizations uh, would say that uh, these crises even require stricter global forest protection because yeah, of the current uh, crisis, in, there is a, an increased need for uh, oil-based products. So also we already see a demand in, uh, in soy, for instance, increase, soy from uh, often deforestation linked Brazil. So they say that yeah, this requires even stricter global forest protection, while the food and feed industry actually asks for delaying the EU regulation even to 2030. 
So finally, palm oil operators in breach of the regulation may face legal and reputational risks. Uh, so actually, in contrast to the voluntary NDPE commitments, the regulation does give a stronger legal basis for enforcing zero deforestation commitments. But how this will turn out in, in practice and in its implementation stage uh, remains to be seen because currently there's only a minimum requirements for compliance checks, for instance. Finally, uh, in response to the upcoming EU deforestation regulation, we have seen that uh, EU member states have started cleaning their country supply chains. And in this process where they develop monitoring system, they also highlight the names of, of traders that are yeah, assumingly high risk traders. So for instance, France, uh, is preparing a monitoring system and it has seen that uh, soy from, from cargo and bungee from, uh, from Brazil, for instance, that these are high risk traders. So in this naming uh, process, there might be also uh, reputational risks for, for companies and traders. So this is my presentation part. I now hand over to Etel. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful presentation. So yeah, just a few words about me. I'm Ethel Igonet. I was working um, recently at the National Wildlife Federation, but I'm now on maternity leave. But this issue is so close to my heart. I'm thrilled to, to join. And um, yeah, prior to NWF, I was at Mighty Earth and Greenpeace Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. So I have a little bit of a human rights and environment hat on as I speak to you. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, the big picture to sort of situate what Sarah was speaking about with the EU regulation and how the EU regulation lands in this broader landscape of multiple jurisdictions moving towards deforestation free laws. So um, let's go to the next slide. And I'm just gonna start by talking about things that are happening in the United States. And then I'm gonna hop over across the ocean to what's going on um, in Europe. So in the US, um, there's a law that Sarah had alluded to, which was in that beautiful chart she put up, which is the Forest Act. That law would cover all the United States. And of course, because it's a federal law, it can regulate imports, which state regulations cannot do. State regulations cannot regulate imports in the same way. So what you're looking at in the United States is this Federal Forest Act and also a state regulation, the California Deforestation Free Procurement Act and the New York Deforestation Free Procurement Act, um, which all do similar but different things. All three actually do change procurement if they pass. So the Federal Forest Act would change federal procurement, which is, of course, huge in the United States. And the California and New York um, state regulations would just alter state procurement. But um, of course, California and New York's economies are huge. Their state procurement is huge. So changing state procurement to require deforestation free palm oil, for example, uh, palm oil is covered um, in all three of those regulations that are up on the screen this would, would, would be fairly sizable. <clears throat> so the, the difference really, I would say, between the state bills and the federal bill is something that you'll also see across the pond. And you could think of these, these cousins, right? The EU law, which Sarah talked about, the UK law and the Forest Act in the United States are sisters, whereas the California and New York bills are um, siblings of a French and Norwegian and Welsh uh, set of policies and laws. And those sibling packs are like cousins, right? So you have two packs of siblings that are sort of cousins. And then I'll, I'll talk about other jurisdictions as well that are moving along. Um, and of course, the, the Forest Act would, would be much more um, uh, impactful for the palm oil industry because the Forest Act would cover all palm oil entering the United States. Um, so one thing to note, um, just to complement what Sarah was saying, these acts that are up on the screen are regulation that limits and curbs deforestation entering palm oil and other high forest risk commodity supply chains into the United States. But um, there's also a bill in the United States called Amazon 21, 
which is designed to provide a lot of assistance to producer countries as they curb deforestation. You could think of the Amazon 21 bill as a sort of assistance approach to help make possible the Forest Act. Um, but the Forest Act itself also provides quite substantial financial and technical assistance to producer countries. So that's really interesting and that isn't so much present in the state bills. One last thing that's interesting <clears throat> is we often forget that there's laws, but there's also executive orders and policies. And we forget that um, they all form this part of patchwork quilt, or if you're looking at the family tree, there's sibling packs and cousins and executive orders can be like a distant cousin. So it's worth noting that the state of Colorado has just put out an executive order for deforestation free procurement in Colorado. This may signal that other states will do the same in the United States. The California and New York bills will probably um, be up for grabs in the next legislative session. And the Forest Act, um, we think, may be uh, voted on in the fall after the elections. So let's hop across the pond and go to the next slide. Um, so of course, there's the EU regulation, which Sarah gave us this beautiful deep dive into. Um, and let's talk about the, the sibling to the EU regulation. Just like the Forest Act and the EU regulation, we have this UK regulation, which is called the UK Environment Act. That actually has already sort of passed into law. So it's sort of a done deal. It received royal assent. It, prior to royal assent, of course, it went through the House of Lords and Commons. And so it received royal assent in November of 2021. And now what's happening is the implementing regulation is being crafted. So the implementing regulation will, um, I think, be uh, elucidated in the coming months. And then we'll know uh, what order which commodities will be dealt with. Um, but what's important to note is that whereas the US, California, New York, and, and federal bills are sort of up in the air, the UK regulation is already kind of a done deal. What does that mean when you're thinking about the EU law? I suppose that for a lot of companies, it means that compliance probably should be seen through this broader scope of how can you strive for absolute excellence to be in compliance with all the regulatory reforms that are coming down the pike, not just EU, but also UK and others. Um, and then we talked about the cousins, right? The deforestation free procurement. So I'd mentioned that California and New York are somewhat similar in that respect to France, Norway, and Wales. So in France, it's already a matter of government policy. <clears throat> it's already baked in to the cake. It's a done deal. And in Norway as well, <coughs> excuse me, Norway for slightly longer. Um, so Wales is a work in progress. Um, but those three jurisdictions all already are all also looking at deforestation free procurement. So it's not imports, but procurement. Um, and now let's go to a more distant branch of the regulatory family, which is similar, reinforcing, but also divergent. Um, so, you know, when you think about what Sarah was presenting with that EU law, you think about the deforestation free procurement bills that are on the table. Let's now toggle to the bottom of the slide and think about these due diligence and supply chain regulations. Here you also see, just like a domino, many jurisdictions are moving in the direction of regulating supply chains. So these regulations aren't necessarily restricted to deforestation only. France has a law called devoir de vigilance, which is roughly translated means duty of vigilance. That's already in effect. There are already cases that have been brought for that law. <clears throat> and that requires um, companies to curb environmental and social harms in their supply chain down to third party suppliers. So it does include an, um, an emphasis on deforestation, but it, it goes more broadly into human rights and other environmental problems. And Norway and Germany and the Netherlands also have bills which aren't yet in force, but have been voted and passed and are going to take effect. So Norway is the, Trace of the, the Transparency Act. In Germany, it's the Lieferkettengesetz, which roughly translates the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. And the Netherlands, it's more specific child labor. Um, but what's interesting is that once these laws kick in, it will require a huge amount of transparency and traceability, which will also essentially make it harder to have deforestation in companies. So 
supply chains. So there's there's a strong relationship, I'd say, between these laws. And then I'll just say in passing, um, there's now a bill in um, New Zealand, uh, which is this human rights supply chain bill, but there's also a bill in New Zealand looking at deforestation, which may be amended to be more robust. Canada's looking at two bills. I won't go into all the different jurisdictions that are thinking about this, but they're quite a lot. And Japan is about to pass not a law, but um, uh, METI, the, the Ministry of uh, Economy, is looking at um, supply chain guidelines. So these guidelines wouldn't have the same force as a bill or an executive order, but they're very influential. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and the next one, please. Um, so let's just talk quickly about similarities and differences. Um, you know, Sarah had this wonderful chart, which is far more detailed. Um, I'll just zip through this quickly to say that palm oil is covered in pretty much all the regulations that are being considered. And then other commodities are sometimes in, sometimes out. So the EU doesn't have rubber and the US Forest Act doesn't have coffee. Um, there's a, a number of, of similarities and differences that we could, we could spend more time on, but the key message is that to be on the safe side and achieve sure compliance with all the regulatory ref reforms that are afoot, it's a good idea to strive for excellence and consider all the, the, the bills that are on the table, um, some of which may pass, some of which may not pass, some of which may pass slower, but um, all of these uh, will probably affect uh, many of the companies that are here on this call today. So let's, let's toggle to the next slide. Um, it's, it's really, I think, notable and beautiful and worth mentioning that many investors and companies that will be regulated by all the bills that we've discussed previously, um, including the EU regulation, many um, investors and companies have spoken out in favor of regulation. And I think the key is that a lot of the most savvy companies and investors have realized that um, speaking out in favor of regulation and in favor of harmonizing regulation gives more credibility to companies and investors who seek to have some influence over um, ensuring that there's harmonization so that if they're sourcing from multiple jurisdictions, it's just easier for them to, to be in compliance. So um, there's these letters that um, uh, are from investors. I believe we have one of our champions on the call today, LGIM. Um, has been a huge champion for this letter. Um, so hats off and thanks to them. But um, actually many, many investors worth around 2.7 trillion in assets under management now have signed onto these bills in favor of the California law, the New York law, the Forest Act. Um, a number of, of regulated industries have also spoken out in favor of the US regulation as, as have other stakeholders like the US Conference of Bishops and a number of, of technical experts. So. We'll just pop over to the next slide, which um, talks a lot about uh, the support for EU and UK regulation. The EU and UK regulation has, by and large, um, been on the table for longer than the US bills. And so there's just a great deal more investor support for that, um, I think, as a reflection of how much time there's been for investors to wrap their minds around uh, the EU regulation and then realize what a good thing it is um, and then come out to support it. So, you know, letters with six trillion dollars in assets under management, five trillion. Um, you know, major major investors, investors and banks have all um, spoken out. I think in a, a pretty clear and admirable way uh, for regulation. So that's kind of a beautiful thing just to flag up for for those of you who are attending this we're in that space. And let's go to the next slide. This will all be shared, so you don't have to worry about um, the various different letters. It's 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 hyperlinked, so when you you'll get the the slides, you'll be able to, to check out those letters yourselves. And the investors are not alone in supporting EU regulation um, and UK, I should say. The huge numbers of companies have come out to support the EU regulation. There's um, Business and Human Rights Center has a compendium of all the support that companies have um, enunciated in letters, in tweets, in um, joint uh, statements to the authorities. Um, and it's, it's well into the thousands of companies that have come out to support regulation in the EU. Not all. I mean, there's some companies that are um, unfortunately on the other side of the ledger, but um, I think it, that's a, a losing battle because there's just so many companies, including major 
companies like, like Mondelez and Olam, I think which are present here today, which have um, really endorsed some beautiful support for the EU regulation, but you know, major corporations like IKEA, Jardine Matheson, Halcyon, Halcyon's not so well known uh, by palm oil folks, but it's 12% of the world's rubber. It's the biggest trader in rubber. It's kind of the Wilmar of, of rubber and, and, and into apparel, cattle, et cetera. Okay, so basically the point here is there's huge corporate support for EU regulation and also UK. Um, so let's go to the next slide. That pretty much wraps up what I was gonna say. And just, um, yeah, a few parting words, which are that um, there's so much uh, energy for legal reform across multiple jurisdictions, not just the EU. So what the EU does has this um, reverberations worldwide, but also what's happening worldwide has ripple effects on the EU. Um, and so, yeah, as a company, it's a great idea to start thinking about how to get into compliance because um, some of these regulations are passing, uh, whether others do or don't, um, some will, will pass for sure. Um, so yeah, this is a, a very exciting time and um, just a, a huge thank you to all of you who are here and a big thank you, especially to the companies and investors who have spoken out so forcefully for regulation. Um, many of you are here today, so lots of gratitude, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Etel. Um, well, I will focus on, uh, on the, uh, the impact of the uh, um, uh, EU regulation on uh, finances and uh, companies and what is their risk in relation to this uh, new EU regulation on uh, deforestation free products and the compliance costs they might, they might face. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this is a well-known picture and um, um, uh, the European palm oil importing actors, which might be affected by the new EU regulation in case of no compliance, uh, they consist of the importers, traders, refiners, um, in, and uh, including the refiners include also, of course, the biofuel uh, refineries. Um, we listed here also the fast moving consumer goods um, and retail and supermarkets as these are creating material value and profits um, uh, in the chain, uh, as we will see later. And uh, sustainable shareholders could feel pressed to demand best in class compliance uh, of them, although they are not immediately required to do this, as the regulation is mainly focused on the importers and traders. Um, the above mentioned uh, actors, they run various risks, as we can see, it's stranded asset risk, it is uh, market access risk, fines. Uh, financing risk, uh, and the overarching reputation risk. Um, companies might be affected, but of course, uh, consequently, consequently also their finances. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, this money trail slide is essential for, 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 for the rest of the analysis that is made. Uh, the slide shows how the various levels in the palm oil supply chain uh, globally uh, create value and profits on the tons of embedded uh, palm oil they use. Um, from upstream to downstream, the pricing up from one level to the next level is significant and it moves from 100, uh, you can see that on the top, to 190, you can see that uh, 194, you can see it at, uh, at the bottom. Uh, and uh, this, 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 uh, this table also reveals that fast moving consumer goods and retail, they earn 66% of all the cross profits made in the chain on embedded palm oil and 52% of operating profit. Um, total operating profit globally on embedded palm oil was uh, 18 billion US dollars in 2020. Uh, and remember this number, this, this will come back in, uh, in one of the next slides. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, Sarah, uh, she proposed me to, uh, to make calculations on three scenarios uh, for uh, uh, European Union compliance costs. The first uh, is based on a best-in-class approach, which we already discussed in an earlier study made by Chain Reaction Research. Uh, this includes internal 
and external auditing, due diligence costs, monitoring, verification costs, as well as paying a premium for certified palm. And we, at that time, the, 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 the best in class costs were around 65 US dollars per, per, per ton. Uh, scenario two is a little bit stricter. Here we include the cost of segregation and Sara already discussed this, that this might be needed. Uh, there are not many sources for cost of segregation, but we use one which would add on average around 12 US dollar to the 65 uh, of the first scenario. And in total that's 77 uh, US dollars per ton. In scenario three, that is even broader and more stricter. And that includes additional financial support for smallholders uh, to incentivize them to join, including uh, costs of replanting and also the cash flow bridge until the new trees. You know that the all the old trees, palm oil trees, they last for around 25 years until the new trees bear fruit. Bear fruit. This might it is just, this is often a very important reason, and because of uh, poverty. Deforestation is linked to poverty. People don't have uh, time to wait for the new trees to, to, for, 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 to bear fruit and they just deforest a new piece of, of land. And um, with this uh, additional scenario three, uh, with additional cost, you might, uh, yeah, well, you might hinder further, uh, prohibit further, uh, prevent further uh, deforestation. Uh, next slide, please. Well, here the three scenarios are summarized and the total compliance cost for the 6 million tons of European Union import might be in the range of 387 to uh, 547 million US dollars. This is excluding economies of scale. They might be significant and in, in excluding further improvements in, in technology. Um, uh, uh, and is this a lot? Well, versus the value of embedded palm oil in the whole chain against the present prices, it would be around 2.5% to 3.5% of the total value. So it would need this type of increase, uh, price increases. However, take into account, we used the full pricing up here for the whole chain. So the 194. And also take into account that embedded palm oil is only a small part of a total product like uh, like blended diesel and like shampoo. Uh, as blended diesel in the European Union has only 6% palm oil or let's say 6% uh, uh, biofuel um, and, excise, and, and also excise duties and VAT are, are added, then the impact on the consumer price would be only 0.1% and nearly the same is true for shampoo. Also that uh, a bottle of, uh, of shampoo would increase from three US dollars to around three US dollars. So nearly no change would occur having the strict scenario. So the, the, the scenario three. Uh, well, stated in another way, it would require a very small price increase uh, to be compliant and to be safe. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this well, financial risk might be huge. Uh, Non-compliance could lead to stranded assets and, and also the other risk I already mentioned. The table calculates here the share of the, uh, for, of the European operate, operators versus the global sheet shown earlier. And we assume that the operating profit generate, generated in the European Union is in line with the percentage of the European operators in the global palm oil consumption. And then around 1430 million 1.4 billion us dollar operating profit is generated on embedded palm oil um, in uh, in europe and that would lead to a dcf value of around 14.3 billion us dollar and this can be seen as a proxy of value at risk related to embedded palm oil so there's quite some uh, 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 qu quite some uh, value at risk for uh, companies and for finances. Uh, next slide, please. And if we compare the calculated compliance costs uh, with the operating profit of the European operators on embedded palm oil, and then the balance is still positive, as you can see. Um, uh, even in the most, uh, in scenario three, there is still uh, uh, 884 balance left uh, on the positive side. 
So as we have seen already in an earlier sheet, uh, slide, a small price increase would reduce the balance to zero. So um, um, that is all that, 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 that is manageable. Uh, next slide. Well, finances, how, how are finance banks and investors affected by the EU regulation? Well, in fact, the proposal does not target finances and they could enjoy a free ride. Uh, of course, they have their EU taxonomy and other reporting directives, uh, says the European Commission. But a group of 100 NGOs has reacted and said that finance will feel not, not enough pressure uh, from this. No, that they don't feel any obligations or accountability. Um, setting up an equivalent regulation for finances, well, it would lead to a further shift of finance to Asia. That happened already in the last 10 years. It will move further then. Um, and maybe European finance would only focus on large actors which can pay for scenario three. Um, um, and finally, um, of course, indirectly, of course, banks and investors who might be affected if their assets are hurt by a lack of compliance, of course, uh, which might hurt the dividend streams and which might hurt their income statement. Uh, and with this, I like to hand over to Matt. Thanks. Thanks, Gerard. And thanks for all the presenters today. And thanks to the audience for all of your questions. We received a lot. And we won't be able to get to them all, but we will answer as many as possible with the time that we have left. Um, also, there were questions about um, a recording and copies of the slides. We will be sending out a recording of the event in the next couple of days. And if you would like a copy of the slides, please feel free to contact us. The first question I have is for Sarah. Um, what's the likelihood that the regulation is implemented in 2023? Will it be implemented for palm oil only or for all, for all, all commodities next year? So first of all, it will be implemented for all six commodities at the same time. Um, and so far, I think uh, it is on track. Um, so I also read a response from uh, from another person who said that uh, the key articles will be impl implemented 12 to 18 months after the publication of the law in the EU official journal and that will happen after the parliament has made its votes and that is planned for September this year so I think yeah it can still happen uh, next year indeed great thanks for that Sarah um, I want to ask a question for Sarah and Etel. So any insights um, from the reactions from the governments of the producer countries? Have there been dialogues between the EU and producer countries on possibly options to mitigate the potential impacts for um, particularly smallholders? Yeah, so I think actually what the EU has done on cocoa is a fantastic model for what could happen with palm oil. And for those of you who are not yet aware, I highly recommend going and checking out something called the EU Cocoa Talks, which were recorded. And I will put a link to that in the chat so that you can also send it around with the recording of the um, webinar. But the EU Cocoa Talks were a whole series of conversations that involved the top cocoa producing governments of Ivory Coast and Ghana, which produce over 60% of the world's cocoa, but also industry. All the key industry players were invited. In fact, there's a number of um, industry people that signed up for this webinar who have presented at the EU Cocoa Talks and NGOs, myself and other NGO um, thought leaders in the cocoa space presented. So it was EU officials, government officials from producer countries, industry and NGOs all coming together and dealing with different issues of how the law will impact cocoa, especially smallholder well-being. So there were entire sessions on living income of smallholders. There were whole sessions on how we can achieve traceability in a way that's realistic and doesn't pre present you know, horrible financial burdens for those who are least able to bear them. You know, what kind of economies of scale can be achieved through joint action? The cocoa talks were amazing. I think it would be great to have EU palm oil talks um, with 
the EU officials who are the relevant folks, but also with the top producer countries, industry and civil society coming together to find creative solutions for things like how to protect smallholders. I'll note the cocoa industry is far more dominated by smallholders than palm oil, and they are smaller smallholders, and they are by and large poorer smallholders. So if we can find good solutions for cocoa, I'm confident we can find good solutions for palm oil. And one last thing about what happened as a result of the EU cocoa talks is um, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the fruit of those labors was announced and it's very beautiful. It's the EU, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana and an industry that jointly endorsed the Alliance on Sustainable Cocoa, which goes beyond the law and it's an ambitious roadmap to improve the economic, social and environmental sustainability of cocoa production with a huge focus on smallholder well-being. So, you know, if you structure the EU palm oil talks the right way, they could yield a similar pact or a similar alliance that would really make sure that this law benefits smallholders and that it's a win-win for everyone. So yeah, there's definitely a model and it's, it's real and it's already happened for another commodity, which is even harder to do it uh, than palm oil. So I think this is totally doable for them. Great, thanks for that, Ikel. So next question for Sarah um, on peatlands. Since peatlands is uh, threatened by palm oil con uh, production, is there any um, chance that it would advance into the ecosystem, that, that this would be included in the law as it's um, moving forward? Um, well, not yet. Uh, it, there is now uh, discussions ongoing on to include other wooded land also uh, next to, to forests. So that would also uh, include, for instance, parts of the Cerrado in Brazil, which is partly uh, wooded lands. Uh, but I don't think yet it will include uh, peatland and also the, the European, European Council, the, the report that came out two weeks ago also only mentioned that uh, it will be after the the text comes into force, it will take another two years before they're going to consider other ecosystems to be included. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, another question for Sarah, um, it's on the cutoff date. If they're applying the same cutoff date for all commodities, then there might be problems. Um, so if they were to change it to a 2015 date, it would not work for uh, commodities from, from Brazil. Could you speak to that? Yeah, that's indeed also a very good question. Um, indeed, there's also uh, talks that the, the whole EU regulation should be very specific to certain commodities and there should be uh, attachments basically to the regulation that applies uh, different uh, standards to different commodities because indeed in Brazil we have the 2008 forest code so it would be most logically if in Brazil it would have the 2008 cutoff date then, for instance, in cocoa, uh, you have the Cocoa and Forest Initiative that is from 2017. So it would also be, yeah, in, in that commodity, more logical to, to base on the, on the 2017 cutoff date and then in palm oil, 2015 cutoff date. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. So we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, Will the burden of proof uh, fall on traders or will corporate end users like food and uh, beverage companies need to do the work of verifying the, their supply chains? I can respond a bit to that, but maybe others also would like to respond. So I think especially also the immediate risk uh, would fall and indeed the due diligence would be mainly for operators and, uh, and large scale traders. Uh, but at the same time, uh, reputational risk may largely apply to uh, downstream companies. So particularly people, the, the public is uh, known to companies like Unilever, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble and Nestle. So they will be largely under more scrutiny uh, based on this EU regulation, although they are not the first uh, commodity traders that are at risk. Maybe someone else yeah. here. Do you also? Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe to add to this, uh, uh, you're right, and uh, they are not obliged to do uh, to do uh, to do what Sarah said, 
and but the reputation risk risk is huge. So uh, they will feel pressed, and uh, to uh, if if they do do not comply, they might lose a lot of value. And investors don't like that if the reputation value is at risk, and that might but might really be significant. So it would uh, for 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 downstream for fast moving for brand companies, it would be very very efficient to invest uh, uh, money uh, annual cost. To be uh, to be very compliant and to be deforestation free. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Harard. So the final question we have here uh, is about the global palm oil market. So the uh, U.S. and the EU combined for a little over ten percent of global palm oil, and that number will will decline with um, the EU taking in less. So how can the laws that we've spoken about today ensure impact beyond these markets rather than just creating a, a bifurcated supply chain? Will the remaining um, will the remaining parts of the global market be able to um, find ways to discourage uh, deforestation in their supply chains? Tell? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. I think one of the most interesting realizations you can come to when you see all the bills that are already on the table being proposed for Canada, for New Zealand, for Australia, for the US, for Norway, for the EU, for the UK. What's illuminating is you can tell this is a global trend of lawmakers around the world seeking to curb deforestation and human rights abuses in supply chains. So if some of those laws pass, but not others, you would have a leakage market problem. However, when you see this number of legislative reforms afoot, it kind of indicates that we're in a, a growing momentum of more and more regulations that are gonna curb deforestation and that companies which decide to try to aim for a leakage market and not get into compliance will be in an increasingly uncomfortable situation of having fewer and fewer options, being more and more restricted and constantly having to move to new places when more lawmakers change their mind and decide to join the global movement for no deforestation and no human rights violations in supply chains. And let's remember, <clears throat> The Japanese government, METI, you know, the most basically the most powerful ministry in Japan, is gearing up to put out these guidelines, right? And the Chinese government has already put out guidelines for no deforestation in rubber, right? The CCCMC. And so the idea that there's going to be a forever leakage market in Asia is actually not very realistic for companies to, to cling to. You know, there's even regulatory reforms afoot in the Philippines to regulate supply chains there. So um, it's a valid concern. It's a good question to ask, but I think the writing is on the wall that these laws are just coming. They may not all be coming quickly. They may not all be coming perfectly. They may not all be coming in a harmonious, perfectly aligned fashion, but they are coming and with them, executive orders, government policies, guidelines. So there's a changing landscape overall, I think. Great, thank you for that, Ethel. And that's all we have time for today. And it's good to end on a positive note, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate our presenters and we thank the audience for uh, joining and for their participation. If we didn't get to your question, please feel free to uh, get in touch with us at any time. And we hope to see you at our events sometime in the future. Thanks again.